Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the newest episode of Simi Pro. It's been a while since we've done a new one. I am Dalton Barrett. You may know me better as Barrett Digital, and in the booth with me, I've got my good friend. Hi, I am Josh Clements. You may know me as Brit Edda. Uh And we're here, we're recording for the first time in like four weeks. <laughs> yeah, it's been like a month, man. It, yeah. <laughs> it's a busy time of year for me, but we had to make time because if we didn't do an episode on this, I would have never forgiven myself. I My life probably would have continued in the same trajectory that it's currently going, which is rock bottom. Right, well... I mean, that's what happened when... Um... <laughs> that's what happened when your life peaks with Zack Snyder's Justice League. Right. Did your life peak with Zack Snyder's Justice League? <laughs> my life... Um, I don't know. My life feels one day emptier because I spent a day watching this movie. Uh, I'm being really harsh already. We'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into that <laughs> in a bit. I do want to say we will do... Uh, this will have copious amounts of pie. Um I mean, spoiler. Spoiler pie. <laughs> right. There's going to be a big, old, a big old tray of spoiler pie coming up um, for Zack Snyder's Just League. If you haven't seen it, check it out before you watch this. Or if you don't care, uh, watch this anyway. Keep, keep listening. I will say there's not much in this movie that you can spoil. But um, do you want to uh, talk about this movie without talking about the behind the scenes stuff much? I, like it'll clearly come up because we're talking about Zack Snyder's Justice League. So it will come up, but talk about it as a movie. But I will say it's a grind to get through all four hours of this movie. Yeah. I mean, I, so we both, I think we both took a break about halfway through, uh, like near the two hour mark. As um, well as a couple of other people I've talked to uh, did as well. Um, yeah. Because those first two hours are a grind to sit through yeah they, they yeah the the first two hours is basically just set up like there's a solid 10 15 minutes dedicated to every character and it's just like this is the character this is the character this is the character and then bell uh I, like it <laughs> that's how i felt about this movie just a big sigh <laughs> well um no well, I, I, I like the movie i like the, the movie. first two hours of this movie are like the first 45 minutes of every other movie that's ever existed. I mean, <laughs> right. The, the, um, the first act is two hours long, and that's that's an issue in its own right. Um, what, did you, what did you think of it, I guess we should say, first? Uh, I really liked it. I was pleasantly surprised. I was expecting significantly worse than what we got. Well, let me say, I'm going to read, and I've been tossing this around because I saw... Uh, my favorite Rotten Tomatoes review of all time for any movie, and it sums up my views of this movie perfectly. I'd love to say that it isn't half bad, but I can't because it's roughly 50% bad. And that sums up my views perfectly. <laughs> the, the second half, like like from the 150 mark on, the, the, the last two hours and ten minutes, I am on board. And I love, like like every second of it, I'm engaged uh, and I really, really like that second half of the movie. There's nothing in there that I really think like I didn't like, but that first half is such a drag. The The setup is so hard to sit through that um, I didn't really care for, for it. Um, so yeah, I, I really, really like, it's sort of like the Lion King where the second half of um, the, the John Favreau live action Lion King, the second half is great, but the first half is kind of like, eh, you know, um, what did you think though? So, okay, I was surprised in a good way. I, I liked it much more than I was expecting to like it. Um, that said, I don't think I like it as much as you do. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far to say it's like, oh, this is a bad movie. Um, it's certainly <laughs> like, it, I guess I just think the movie's all right. Like, it's not. It's not a masterpiece because I've seen I've seen a lot of people toss that out there. They're saying like it's a masterpiece of cinema, it's a masterpiece of comic movies. I don't think that at all. I think it's just long, and <laughs> I, I think I think when something's long, in in the same way that my view of Batman vs Superman is, people think it's deep because it's dark. People think it's good because it's long, and I just like. So what it, do you say to people like me who think it's good but also think it's too long? 
I say you're wrong, but that's, that's <laughs> <it>. <laughs> no. I, I I I understand why people like the movie. I um I respect that. I just don't think it's for me. I like it's just so. Uh, I, I I've mentioned to a couple of people like I don't have any major complaints with the movie. I know you have one, which we'll get into. I have one, and I'm gonna. That'll be like the last thing we talk about <laughs> after we break down the whole plot. I want. I'm gonna bring up the glaring plot hole. That's going to ruin this movie for everyone. It won't ruin it for you probably, but man, it, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Like I don't have any complaints about the movie. I just have a lot of nitpicks and I, I hate saying that because I hate nitpicking stuff. It's just, it ruins the experience for everyone else. But my, my issue was it was, it was, there's so much stuff to nitpick that it ended up kind of like, when you've got so many, it creates a couple of plot holes, or it, it brings down the overall quality, at least. Yeah, I, I see that. Um, we, we compared notes a bit, and most of your nitpicks seem to come in, like, the first half of the movie, kind of like Yeah, no, I, de I definitely said it. The first half of the movie is where most of the problems lie. Uh, right. I, I think if you, if you took it as, like, Justice League Part 1 and Part 2, then Justice League Part 1 is trash, and Justice League Part 2 <laughs> is phenomenal. Um, yeah, it reminds me a lot of of Rogue One. There are two movies that it really reminds me of. Um, one of them is Rogue One in that everybody loves Rogue One because the last 30 minutes of Rogue One are phenomenal. And in that, you kind of forget that the first um, hour and a half of Rogue One is really boring and nothing happens. But then by the time the movie wraps up, by the time you're on Skyrim, everyone's like, oh, this is the best thing. <laughs> right. But by, by, by the time the credits start rolling, you're so wrapped up in that final act that it's like the greatest movie ever made. Um, and I think that can that that definitely applies applies to this. Let's break down. Let's go through the plot. Uh, at least plot. The light. movie has a plot? <laughs> Let's go through the plot light. Uh, and we'll roll <laughs> through it. Um <laughs> I say plot light because we don't it's have a four hour movie. <laughs> four hour movie. I will say the first thing that stuck out to me and my first note is four by three aspect ratio is annoying. <laughs> that um, was my third note. Um it this movie is not it's not like a traditional four by three and or I guess not traditional, but the way that typically that's done today, movies like The Lighthouse or or other modern movies that are four by three, typically they shoot in full screen. Uh, and then close off the mat on the side to make it um, four by three. This movie was shot with an open mat instead, um, where it was literally shot this way with the intention of if it's released full screen, they put mat bars on it and so on and so forth. It was it was intended to be cropped I, I, instead of being cropped to be four by three. It was four by three to be cropped later. Uh, Zack Snyder apparently liked that when he shot some IMAX scenes. So the movie looks great in IMAX, but it looks bad everywhere else. The movie looks great in IMAX. It's just a shame that no IMAX cinemas are open because we're kind of in the middle of a pandemic. Well, maybe for you. Um, yes, maybe for me. I <laughs> left my home in so long. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, 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 the Openton movie is kind of neat. It, it starts off in a worse way than BVS does because it's... In BBS, where it's like, oh, this is the Man of Steel end scene from a new perspective, and it's like, it's really interesting because you kind of see a different, you see a ground perspective on it all when you see like human stakes in it. Yeah. Uh, with this one, it's just kind of, it, it's like, it's just the end of BBS again, <laughs> except they show you that the other heroes are actually around in this world and chose not to do anything. <laughs> yeah, I. the The opening credits of this. The opening credits of Theatrical Justice League is probably my favorite moment from the movie, like in general, from the theatrical cut of the movie. And I definitely preferred them to the opening credits of this one. Um, seeing what the world looks like without Superman was such a neat uh, was such a neat thing, and it's it's necessary for the plot of that movie. Superman doesn't play into the plot of this one quite as much. Um, which is not necessarily a complaint, but it is a complaint that I like the opening of the, the theatrical version better. Like the song was great. Like we have right. The, 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 the oranges being stolen and, and, and the, the crime rising and the homeless man sitting there, like, like all that stuff was just so emotional. It was, a, it was like 
it was good world building in five minutes. Yeah, I think so. I think it did yeah. a really good job of of showing us, okay, this is what happens without Superman. Like Superman came and he showed us the good in the world and now he's gone. Granted, Superman in this movie didn't come and show us the good in the world, but Superman in this movie came and showed us that if you mope around hard enough, someone else will do your stuff for you. Right, basically. Yeah. We're not talking about BVS. We got to get off that. Um, but yeah, I do prefer the opening credits of the theatrical version because this movie doesn't have an equivalent of that 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 makes you feel what the world is like without Superman. There's no scene that um, kind of mirrors the opening credits, uh, but the opening credits in 30 seconds or, or two minutes, however long it is, shows us instantly like, okay, this is the world without Superman. It's done. Um, we don't even really need to talk about it because we've already shown it. Uh, and this movie doesn't have a an equivalent of that. And then we kind of cut to uh, the Batman trying to recruit Aquaman scene from uh, we we saw a different version of it in the theatrical version. But um, well, this, this one just seemed really abrupt. Like and everything just kind of it just kind of went bang right into it. And I don't know. There didn't seem to be like an introduction. I didn't mind that. Just because I, I, I mean, I would find that because I, I think we like. I guess in the theatrical version, you saw the introduction. <laughs> so really what you need to do is you need to watch the theatrical version and this side by side, but you need to pause one and play the other at certain points. Well, but we never really got an introduction to it in the, in the theatrical version. It went from Batman riding his horse through the, the wilderness, which we see in the opening credits of this one, to uh, to him talking to Aquaman. Like, it, it, it gives it the same setup. The... The, the real setup for it comes after when he's talking to Alfred, you know, uh, in both versions. So I Which, think, I think yeah, I, yeah, I guess um, I do like that. They actually they straight up just said Aquaman like they're not. Yeah, they, they didn't shy away from names, which was nice. That's um, like except for uh, one. they shut away from one name and it's going <laughs> to it's going to crack you up. I was I've been waiting to bring this up to you. They renamed the lasso of truth. What did they rename it to? I, I don't know. I can't. I don't remember. <laughs> but I just remember watching the scene. Yeah, she like she lifts up someone. She goes like the lasso of whatever compels you. Yeah. Instead of calling it the lasso of truth, which it's like you're freaking, you're holding a man with a glowing lasso to just say the lasso of truth. <laughs> all, all, <laughs> I can think of, all I can think of is the power of Christ compels you. <laughs> right. Well, it is Zack Snyder. Um, <laughs> so Aquaman. That leads me into my next point. Uh, Aquaman is also worshipped like a deity just like superman <laughs> um and for whatever reason we get like two scenes of aquaman being worshipped like what's jesus the, what's one the of them comes later um when he's saving that guy on the ship and yes um, yes that feels, and he like he's carrying him like across <laughs> yeah well he the, he's like holding out his arm to the guy and then he tosses him on the bar probably kills him with his strength and <laughs> then he gave steals. him blunt force trauma to the back of the head here right. <laughs> and then steals from him um then after the aquaman scene we cut to wonder woman um which is a different version of the scene that we saw in the theatrical version again right this, um, in this version of the scene she kills many people right uh, there are definitely some some dead innocent bystanders it's the same scene where there's like there's bank robbers who threaten to and what what do they like uproot the national natural order or something? Yeah, we really have no idea what they're doing. Yeah, I, I was really confused because they just kind of like they don't they don't have any. There's it doesn't pay off. Nothing with that happens other than that yeah. one joke about how like uh that he's like, oh, what do you do on the weekends, Diana? And then she's like, oh, nothing. In the in the theatrical version, they um they're just bank robbers, like they're just normal bank robbers. But in this one, they're trying to like. Um, oh, the guy says, <laughs> the guy, he basically says the, um, <laughs> reject society, <laughs> race monkey. Um, and that gave me a chuckle. Uh, uh but yeah, and then one of them stops like, them. One of them stops them, then it shows you outside, and there's a big explosion from where the bomb is. Uh -huh. No, no, she, uh, she uses her gauntlets, and there's like a big shockwave from it. Yes. And she causes an explosion that's as big as the one that the bomb would have caused. <laughs> Probably it small. doesn't touch the children. I think the bomb would have been smaller because it doesn't. I don't know. And also, she vaporized the man. Like afterwards, they show him he's just got a hat left, and yeah. there's a line of children. She goes to save one of them. She's like, "Hey, are you okay?" And all I could think of is I'd be going, "No, you just murdered a man." Yeah, he's dead. You just killed, you know, hundreds of bystanders. So after we get done with that Wonder Woman scene, um, 
we we cut to Steppenwolf for the first time as he's kind of doing his Steppenwolf thing, and he looks worse <laughs> than he did in 2017 design wise, CGI wise. I, I think he looks better. Yeah, I uh, the CGI is really fantastic. Oh, it's stellar. Um, there's like a couple of scenes where he looks a bit. I, everything felt a bit weightless at times, but that other than that, the uh, the CGI really was just phenomenal. I've got a note here because this movie is bro- broken into parts, right? There are eight different parts, and I don't remember the titles exactly, but I do remember realizing about halfway through that the titles didn't have anything to do with this <laughs> yeah. in the yeah. parts. Yeah, the um, first one's called like like it's isn't it like in the night of Batman or something? Yeah, it's it's dedicated solely to Batman, and Batman's in one scene of the first part. It's it's a half hour of the movie. Batman's in there for like two minutes. Five minutes. Yeah, he's not even in. He's not in the main part of the scene that he's in. Right. Um, w- which is weird, and none of them seem to tie into to what they're talking about. The only uh, the only one I noticed, I think there's one that's called like all the all the king's men or something, and Alfred says that to Bruce. Mm-hmm. But other than that, I like like they didn't seem to hold any bearing whatsoever. It's really confusing. Yeah, w- the you would think if the parts are dedicated to that, it would be something that like spans that part. Um, kind of like how comic book runs do it, right? It's a it's a series comic book run, but each part is dedicated to a thing, and so that's the title of that part. You would think yeah. that would be the case. Well, but th- this movie has a couple of bits of that. Like I remember it, when Steppenwolf appears on uh, Themyscira, and he's like, "Find the Amazonians." He he just starts waxing poetic for no reason, and he's like, "I will bathe in your blood." And I'm just thinking, you don't know these people. Well, Steppenwolf would technically probably know the Amazonians, right? Well, he wasn't that, that leads into the, the plot hole that we'll get into later. Um, <laughs> so we, we were also introduced to Cyborg. Um, yes, yeah, who is who, an emo. Yes, he's much better in this movie than he was in Theatrical Justice League. Like, I completely he's understand where, yeah. where, where Zack Snyder was coming from, where, like, he, he does feel like the heart of this movie. The, this movie sort of revolves around him. He's the hero who's, uh, I guess Flash is technically the hero who saves the day at the end, but... He, oh, you know, none of them want to save people. Well, yes, except for the Flash. Gosh, except um, for the Flash. <laughs> but he de- he definitely has the the most emotional kind of arc yeah. throughout. Yeah, the movie. here's the here's the most emotional through line. Right, and, and that was neat. But he kind of starts off um, as just uh, like a jerk. <laughs> um, he, he starts off by being mad at his dad for saving his life. Yeah, um, and, and we. We can nitpick that scene all day, yeah. but we've got four hours of movies to go through. Yeah, it, like that, the, the scene's fine. It, it, you know, um, Miles Dyson wants to make another robotic apocalypse, so that's right. You know, beside the point. That, what a type cost to be held as the man who yeah. always brings out the, <laughs> the end of days through robots. And he was definitely, in, it, that was done intentionally. They cast him intentionally. Yeah, they absolutely. Did, didn't. I am. Um, um, I also just wanted to say that there's a good amount of Alfred and Batman in this movie, and I love it. It's some yeah. of my favorite Batman Alfred conversations. Period. This is um, easily, and the more I think about it, my favorite version of Batman that we've seen. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah like, like not my favorite Batman movie by like at all. I'm not saying that. Take take BVS out of the equation. The version of Batman that we're presented with in this movie is easily my favorite we've seen on screen. Um, He's, he actually feels hopeful. Yeah, he feels he feels hopeful. He feels like, um, and they sort of sub out his parents' death for Superman's death in the way that like he That's wants his driving, to driving force. Right, he wants to to help people so that he wants uh, to honor Superman's legacy, basically. Right. Uh, Superman's his legacy gets to live on his 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 memory gets to live on his death wasn't for nothing in the same way that you know he's that that's always his motivation with his parents um and that was awesome I really really liked the way that he was presented in this movie and Alfred the way Alfred was presented in this movie was just great um it makes me sad because I wish we got more Jeremy Irons Alfred same same this movie because I'm not on board with the whole restore the Snyderverse thing, uh, but if we get anything from the Snyderverse that continues on, I really hope it's some stuff with Ben Affleck's Batman. Yeah, um, yeah, no, definitely. That that's the only and Ezra Miller's Flash and and stuff. I would also be down for, but, I, but mainly... <laughs> well, speaking of Ezra Miller's Flash, 
Um, there's so, like I said, the first kind of two hours of this movie is just setting up all of the characters in the movie. It, it's setting up all of the their conflicts, their driving forces, why they're in the movie, basically. Um, and so it kind of goes piece by piece. It goes like Aquaman, Wonder Woman, uh, Steppenwolf, Cyborg. Uh, I, then I think it's Flash. I think so. And then after they set them up the first time, they cut back to to, to different characters and stuff. Right after that, it um, starts being more about them mingling. But um, right. Yeah, I, I the Flash stuff in this is just great for the most part. I should say, uh, like it's 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 good for the most part at least. Uh, the, the scene with him saving Iris is the my worst least thing. favorite <laughs> scene in the movie. And the, it was one of those things where where... it's just so like it's not just one thing that brings it down for me it's kind of everything yes it's that thing where you were talking about where it's like yeah all of these things are nitpick but nitpicks but, but then when, it's every, when it's every single frame like yeah it makes the whole scene bad like like yeah, yeah each of them on their own are nitpicks but it's every single frame of that scene ezra miller is annoying he's a, he's um, got like the tasm 2 creepy spider-man vibes where he's pressing yeah. someone who just looked at him yeah, Iris is an idiot, apparently. I, Iris drives away without looking where she's going. There's a truck driver who drops his sandwich, plows through a hot dog cart, and is still just trying to reach his sandwich and can't pull on the brakes for some reason. Yeah, it, it, it's it's all... That, that scene's bad. And I thought when we saw the deleted footage of it, where it was like Ezra running out and, and the glass shattering. I was like, this is so cool. I do not understand why they cut it. But now after seeing it, I'm like, yeah, no, I, I get it. <laughs> yeah, and he's also, uh, he's speaking at a million miles an hour, which kind of makes sense for the character, but he's like, he's the most annoying person. On Earth. There's this, um, there's this movie, or no, it's a mini series that I watched that was pretty good um, called The Act, and it's about... Um, yes, uh, the, the Gypsy Rose murder. Yes. Uh, it's 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 about that. Have you seen it? Uh, I haven't seen it. No, but I just know of it. Okay, so the the boyfriend in that movie, who is the one who murders the mother, right? Um, it's not Ross Lynch. It's the ginger dude oh, from it's Austin the, Allen. Yeah, it's it's his mate from. Uh, yeah, yeah. He he's he plays the 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 murderer, and he acts and talks just like <laughs> Ezra Miller does in that scene. I swear, <laughs> like. Ezra what? Miller is basically as good as a murderer. Right. Well, and that was the thing. They were they, they were presenting him as like creepy and not all there and like this kind of stuff. And Ezra Miller talks and acts just like him in this, um, which really threw me off. Uh, I've got on my notes, first impressions of Ezra Miller's Flash is very annoying. <laughs> I, um, that my notes too. I, I also wanted to note that like, so in certain scenes, they throw uh, non-OST music in there. Mm -hmm. And it just feels really misplaced. It, it feels like someone was it. on a radio while they were doing it. And Zach was like, yeah, throw that in. I didn't mind it, actually. I thought I would, um, but okay. I didn't. I, I, I liked it in this scene. Um, and then I really liked it in the Aquaman scene that, that comes a little later. Where See, I think I think it bothers me because the actual OST stuff is really good. Mm -hmm. Like for the you most know, part, the soundtrack is, is is absolutely stellar. I know you don't like the Amazonian stuff. I do. I think it was a bit overused, but I really like it. I didn't mind it at first. It was just when it when I had to listen to it for fifteen minutes, and you can it's just one like <laughs> singing voice that's looped over and over again. Yeah, it feels like like your daughter's dance recital or something. Right. Um, it's about this time in the plot that we are. Um, we're, we're given Steppenwolf's actual motivation. Um, mm, he, yeah. he basically, he he betrayed Darkseid in some way, shape, or form. We were not really told how. Uh, and he's trying to get back on his good graces so that he can come back home is basically what it comes down to, which is a far more compelling motivation than we had in um, 2017. 2017, where he just kind of shows up for no reason. Yeah, wow. he, well, he's he's basically just he's in debt. He has to do like fifty thousand worlds or something. He's he's basically like an intergalactic delivery man. Basically, yeah, he's terraforming all these planets for Darkseid, and that's that's his goal. Uh, it is also worth noting that Darkseid's plan here is literally just Zod's plan for Man of Steel. Um, <laughs> like I I mean basically right I mean he's looking for for a MacGuffin but it, it's practically just they they've used the terraforming Earth thing twice now 
yeah, um, and yeah. With one movie in between. So it, well, that that's a bit annoying. There's slightly different motivations, I suppose. There's odd ones more like, oh, I want to save my people, and this one's like, oh, I want to control the galaxy. But well, yeah, at, but even then, at the end of the day, it just comes down to we want to make the world a ball of fire. But isn't the thing like Dark Side wants to make Earth the new apocalypse and live there? Like, isn't that? No, he, it? no I think it was just like I. I thought it was just he wants to terraform these places so that he has minus slaves, and he's looking for the anti-life equation. But we don't oh. find that until later. Right. All right. Well, that's fine. That's fine. We do find out about the anti-life equation in here somewhere. Um, it, uh, I think it was like the second mother box. Maybe. Oh no no! Do you know what it was? It was um. It, it, it was during it, that flashback scene, the dialogue dump. No, no, no. It was a, it was during the second mother box because uh, Steppenwolf re reaches out and touches it, and then he does the exact same scene that Darkseid did like twenty minutes earlier. That's right. That's right. Um, so as we're kind of going through, I've also got on here uh, Cyborg is computer Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> but I I put on here that every DC dad is just the worst person, and which is true. And um, you know, uh, Pa can't tell Scott can't to let a bus full of. People Kids. die. Paul uh, sounds like, yeah, you can use nukes if you wanted to. <laughs> right. Um, uh, uh, Thomas uh, Wayne just dies. Like, Thomas, Thomas Wayne doesn't like, do anything. <laughs> and uh, Barry <laughs> Allen's dad's like, hey, look, I, Barry Allen's like, hey, look, I understand that you're doing all of this stuff to help me, your father. But, you know, I don't really care about any of that. Like, just leave me alone. <laughs> No, no, no! Dad in the DC universe seems to want to be involved with their sons. <laughs> um, we are also we're almost at the halfway point, and we get. Uh, I've got two things to mention here. About an hour and fifteen minutes into the movie is when the first joke hits, right? Because people were saying like this movie is much more humorous, and 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 I do think the humor in this movie works far better than twenty seventeen. It's but only it's, more uh, natural. But but when your first joke comes an hour and fifteen minutes into the movie, it's really jarring, <laughs> and it really takes you takes you out. It was super out of place, and I don't even remember what the joke was. I think it was Batman and Diana. Um, oh, the uh, uh, more 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 less. Yeah, I think that was it, and it was just like I said, super jarring and weird, and I wasn't expecting it, and it threw me off. Yeah, um, I, I, I've, then, I've got my notes about the Ackman scene. Because I think it's at this point we see that Ackman is talking to Volko, and uh, Volko's like, "Pierce the heart I was born." <laughs> uh, First we attack. The heart. Heart. Yeah, it, it, it was really weird. Uh, so Ackman goes to visit a shrine of his granddad, and then Volko appears, and uh, Bruce and Diana talk about this. They go, "Oh, he can breathe on the water, so he's Atlantean, but he can breathe on air, so he's a half blood." But then. Every Atlantean that talks to him talks to him in an air bubble. So is every Atlantean a half blood? Because all of them breathe on air. There's some that come out to the ground later because Steppenwolf's interrogating them. So do they are they all half bloods, or did they just not? Did they forget that they wrote that line? I I, I would have to think it's they forgot that they wrote that line. I, that's the only thing I can think of. Um. And then we get to see Alfred help, help Diana make tea, which is yeah, probably the, the 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 most heartfelt scene in the whole movie. Yeah. Um. So let's get you know let's get first half consensus here real quick. The first half of the movie is just done. Oh, also about the one fifty mark is the first time we see the Batman or the oh, Flash uh, in their yeah. costume. Um, <laughs> which is two hours into a four hour movie. <laughs> right. Um, but that kind of, for me, marks that, you know, we see the Jim Gordon scene, which is awesome. And I love Jim Gordon in this I, movie. I love J.K. Simmons. Yeah. J.K. Simmons as Jim Gordon is like one of the best casts of all time. And I love it. Um, but that for me is the moment where the first half ends and the second half kind of starts. That's like the pickup point, right? If I ever rewatch, I've seen this movie twice. If I ever rewatch it again, I will start at that scene. Um, so what is your first half consensus? Like, how do you feel just about the first half? Uh, I think that this movie would be a lot better if you condensed a lot of that. Because a lot of it is multiple scenes to set up all of the main players. And while I understand, you know, why you need that, I also think that you can do that in 30 minutes and have it be just as good. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think... Um, one of the movies that I, I think you can compare this to is Guardians, the the first Guardians. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
I think it it sort of tonally fits very similarly. Um, not tonally, I mean structurally fits very similarly. But what what took Zack Snyder two hours to do, James Gunn was able to do in forty five minutes. Um, and so th- that's just kind of how I feel on that. So, um, I think this first half condensed down to something that was about 45 minutes, uh, and, and sort of restructured and rewritten would work really well. Um, and I could, I could sit through a two hour and 45 minute version of this movie, you know? Um, yeah, I, well, yeah, like my biggest gripe with the entire movie is that it's four hours long because it doesn't need to be four hours long. My biggest gripe with, with this movie is that the first two hours are boring and this movie is four <laughs> hours long. Yeah. In, in the t- b- Before we get to Batman wearing his suit for the first time and Flash wearing his suit for the first time, the theatrical cut of Justice League would be over. And <laughs> that that's not a compliment. Like that... That's that, my that's biggest that's issue true. with the movie, um, but I digress. Let we'll 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 come back to that. Okay. At the end. I will say in that scene, uh, you get the first kind of glimpse at Flash's uh, powers. Like, so we've seen it twice before. Once in his warehouse where he has fifty thousand screens, <laughs> and uh, the other in the really really creepy scene. But uh, this is kind of like the first time you see it from an outsider's perspective because those are both P- POV, right? Uh, and it's it's so cool because the first time you see it is uh, they all disappear after Gordon turns his back. He's like, oh, that's rude. And then he fash- vanishes. Um, and I really like it because just before he does that, you can kind of, they, they make a sound of like a build up of the lightning. And then yeah. he's gone. And then there's like a puff of smoke and he looks like the roadrunner. And I love it. it. It reminds me of the way, like, it reminds me of Batman almost where it's like, like, puff of smoke like like smoke bomb and then he disappears it sort of feels the same way but with lightning like there's a cloud of lightning around him and then he's just gone and i really liked it um yeah and also when they save the uh, hostages like you also i think they show him running around and it's like you see sort of flashes like still images of where he's been like a like a shadow of it almost and it, it just looks so cool the, the flash stuff in this once you get past that first scene is probably the best stuff in this movie. I, I would say it's either the Flash stuff or the Batman stuff. Yeah, um, the the Flash stuff in this movie is the the special effects wise. W- they didn't just do the twenty seven or, or um, didn't just do the Flash CW stuff where it's like, oh, there's a trail of lightning and that means he's running. No, no, it's it's unique and it's original and it's different and it makes more sense like like realistically and, and it's just so cool. Um, like, like you said, those still images where he's like jumping around talking to people, it's not, he's moving so fast. You can't see him. There's like a light and, but then there's like, diff, like you said, ghost of him. It, it, it just, it looks, it looks so good. I really hope they carry that over to, uh, the, the flash movie. movie that isn't going to be nice. Right. It, it didn't look like this in 2017 for whatever reason. They, they right. made it more traditional. Um, uh, I guess they're just trying to ape off the TV show. Yeah, I would assume so. It does make more sense now, given that uh, Steppenwolf has yellow lightning, that they made Flash's lightning blue. Um, it distinguishes him from that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that makes sense, I guess, why they did it. Now, could they have just made Steppenwolf's lightning blue and Flash's lightning yellow? Sure, but I don't mind it. It doesn't yeah. really bother me at all. We're really kind of in the first team-up action scene of the movie. Um, uh, at this yeah, point, the sewer scene, right? Yeah, we're we're in the sewer scene, um, underneath the harbor, and it's really cool. It, you know, it came really late in the movie, um, but it's fun, and it kind of felt well earned. Like these characters, you you understand them going in. It's almost yeah. like it's a sequel, and it's the <laughs> second time you're seeing these characters. It, it works almost as well as a movie should. Right. Um, and then Aquaman comes in and kind of hops in. He was just chilling in the harbor for whatever reason, not helping out until the the the, the water broke. And even then, he doesn't really help out because they like they. It looks like they were going to get out of there anyway. They get halfway out of the tunnel and then they just give up and move. Yeah, I, like I said, I think they got as far as they needed to for the water to come up. I did when I rewatched it the second time. There's a lid on the tunnel. Um. 
there's no it's not open at the top it's closed i I just i just remember that cyborg's piloting the nightcrawler and he gets like halfway up and then he just leaves the rest of them and flies away (laughs) he hops out and flies away yeah there's a lid on there so it's not like they could have crawled the crab machine out I, i like the scene where he hops in and he goes all right Alfred, I'm taking over. I loved that. Just yeah, because Alfred's like, who are you? <laughs> right. Um, and we, we go back to Steppenwolf, and this is where I made the realization of the big plot hole. I've got it in my notes, the 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 ultimate realization of the movie. The, they're going through, and Steppenwolf is looking for these mother boxes, and he's struggling to find them all, right? He's got two of the three, but he's got to find the third one, and he's got to fight the Justice League to get the third one. Okay, whatever. Um Steppenwolf, you know, Darkseid's been here before, and in that flashback scene, Wonder Woman tells us that the mother boxes are technology, right? They're advanced technology made on apocalypse to terraform planets. Steppenwolf has been going around and terraforming other planets. So here's my question. Why didn't Steppenwolf just bring three new mother boxes with him so that he could just (laughs) hop off his ship, terraform the earth, and then get out of there? Uh, Why did he want to use the three that were already here? He could just literally bring three more. So I don't understand why well, this movie needed to happen. I don't. I, I, the whole. I, I, so I thought about this when they had the history scene. Um, so Darkseid gets off, merges the boxes, and then like there's a big battle that ensues. And they spend like 30 minutes merging the boxes. But then in the finale, they do it in like two seconds. Yeah. And I just like, I was, I was just thinking, I was like, why do they need like a big armada to do all of this stuff? Can't you just drop down in the middle of nowhere and boom, bing, you're done? Also, you can why, can't, why can't you move them? Like, why couldn't yeah. Steppenwolf have just grabbed the mother boxes and teleported somewhere else to, to kick them off and then made the league have to struggle to get there? Yeah. You know? well, why, does he, why doesn't he terraform Mars and Venus and all of these other planets that are in our solar system that you could also use? Well, I don't think they would have had the mindless slaves, Josh. Um, right, because there's no humans there. The the build up to Superman's return, which is where we're kind of getting towards, um, does feel a bit more compelling in this outside of that opening scene. There's there's a bit more build up to it in this movie. Um yeah. with Lois and, yeah. and uh, there's that there's a really great scene where Lois and Martha have a really heartfelt conversation. They're going, Oh, you know, I I loved your son. Oh, he was the best person. He would have wanted us to keep on moving and push on, and push forward. They're taking away my home, but you know it's fine. I'm just gonna. It's too lonely for me anyway. And it's like it's a really good heartfelt scene that makes you feel for Lois and makes you feel for Martha. And then Martha steps out and she changes into a giant green alien in the middle of a hallway. And I was thinking, this is a weird move for her to take. Yeah, it. That was so forced, and it, it, it's probably my least favorite scene in the whole movie because it was such a good scene when it was Lois and Martha talking. Uh, yeah, and I, I also know I want to know the reasoning where he like he steps out as Martha, looks around, changes into a giant green alien, stands there for like thirty seconds, and then goes, "Yes, I should be a man again," which also ruins the reveal. Right? right? How much better would it have been had he stepped out of the room, transforms into the general, and then walks away, right, with the, the corniest dialogue on the planet, and then at the end of the movie, that's when it's revealed that he's Martian Manhunter, like when they do the Martian Manhunter scene at the end of the movie. Why um, Why on earth – I don't know. That that just is, is obnoxious. Like all they had to do was just have him transform and – most comic book fans would have gotten the idea anyway. You didn't have to be so on the nose about it. Well, you and it really it like, ruined that whole scene. You could have just had the eyes flash red if you want to do right. that. Yeah, but well, that's have the eyes flash red. Two and seasons. You could have him transform into the general, but why is he transforming into the alien and then back into the general? It doesn't make any sense. And again, it, um, it, the, the character it ruins the scene when it's like, oh, this isn't that character. It actually, has a lot of weight to this kind of stuff. But yeah. yeah. I, I, after that, we we get them kind of setting up the Superman scene. They're digging up the body, and it was kind of it was at this point that I realized I really wish we had more scenes of the League interacting, because not like fighting, but just like no, no, doing just stuff like talking fighting. to each other. Yeah, I, there's a great scene. So uh, Vic, Vixen and Flash are digging up the body, and uh, uh, Wonder Woman and Aquaman are talking. She's like, I really hate all of you Atlanteans, which makes Wonder Woman just seem kind of racist. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, but, uh, and Aquaman are both racist. Oh, yes, Aquaman's yeah. not. I, I, Aquaman's very accepting. He's he, well. He's like she's like. Hey, I really hate Atlantean people. And then he goes, Hey, yeah, me too. And they're just kind of having a beer, and they like chat about their history, I guess. And it was just nice to see them bonding. And the same yeah. thing happens again with uh, Flash and Aquaman. Basically, I wanted to see an Aquaman movie where he just talks to people. Yeah, well, and and uh, Aquaman and or, or Flash and Cyborg while they're digging up the grave was nice. Yeah, they um, them them just kind of chilling. But like, it, I, I wish we had that in the first like half of the movie instead of well, separate scenes. We get a bit of that uh, between Diana and Bruce and Alfred and Diana, but it's really isolated to those three characters. Right, and we also uh, know those three characters, I guess. I, I basically I just wanted a bit more variety in it, I suppose. Yeah. Um. I agree. We we they finally succeed in raising Superman back from the dead, and it's a really neat. Um, it's the most powerful we've ever seen Superman. But um, he just he takes hits and just shocks them off. Yeah, and it's awesome. And I really like. Um, it's I like the way it's done, in comparison to twenty seventeen, like mm-hmm. much better because Superman comes back from the dead evil, like straight up evil in twenty seventeen. He has his memories. He just is evil for whatever reason. Because Superman um, is evil in this universe. Right. Well, but this is Joss Whedon's reshoots of it. Like, he's saying things like, you couldn't have just let me die, you know. He asked Batman, like, do you, bl-? like, all that kind of stuff. But in this movie, it's like, he's not even, he's trying, it's 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 almost like it's he's trying like, it, Yeah, primal instincts. Yeah, he's trying primal to figure out what's going on, because he just came back from the dead. And as he's trying to figure out what's going on, he feels threatened. And then he has to attack. Like, it's it's just instinctual. Uh, and I really liked that much better. Um, I thought that was that was great. And it leads into easily, easily my favorite stuff in the whole movie, which is Clark Kent back at the farm. Um, every scene on that farm with Clark and Lois and, and when Martha comes in is great. The scene where she's walking out to see him and he's standing in the cornfield, which we're going to talk about the cornfield in just a second. When he's <laughs> when he's standing out in the cornfield and Lois walks out behind him and she's wearing the engagement ring and Clark he's says, like, I guess uh, you said yes, right? Like like that stuff's awesome. Yeah, and he's uh, like, "Oh, hey, Ma." But here's what it goes to. Here here's where the corn comes back. No no one wants to hear about the corn. <laughs> I I can only assume that Lois had to panic and find that ring to put it on because there's no way she was wearing it. Oh, she was too busy having pregnancy tests in her apartment. Yes. So here, here's where the corn comes up, right? We have that scene earlier with Lois and she's in her apartment and she opens up a drawer and Zack Snyder moves the camera to focus on this pregnancy test. And then she goes and I could only assume takes it. She grabs something out of the drawer and walks into the bathroom. She, um, she grabs, well, she grabs like a key card. Well, she grabs her she grabs her Daily Planet badge, and then it cuts to the wide shot, and then she reaches back in the drawer and walks into the bathroom, which I would assume is to take the pregnancy test, like to actually take the test. Okay, so uh, the reason I, I started thinking about it is earlier in the movie, Alfred said some, something along the lines of, oh, it's been a while since Lex Luthor said whatever. We're never given a clear indication of when this movie takes place, but yeah. I figured it out. So... <laughs> Batman v Superman takes place in November. We know that from the newspaper where Clark Kent dies, um, where where Superman dies. We know that this movie takes place in November. So, Superman dies in November. Corn season, uh, the season in which corn is ready to harvest, is in September. So, this corn is not quite ready to harvest, but is close. So, let's say, hmm, what's the month before September? Uh, August. August. Okay, let's say it's August when Superman is resurrected. That means it was nine months since Superman has been dead and Lois is taking a pregnancy test. Hmm. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> Lois is taking a pregnancy test nine months after Superman has been has died. So it's clearly not his kid. So it's, oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, that's just little things that tie into that that um, Lois Bruce Wayne relationship that Zack Snyder. Uh, Bruce Kent is what's going to be his name. Right. The, there's a little. There's another little nod when Lois steps in to keep Superman from killing Batman, um, where you're like, okay, I can see that that this was influenced by that cut thing. If you don't, if you're not familiar with that, 
um, one of the things Zack Snyder wanted to do in these movies was after Superman died, he wanted there to be a relationship between um, Bruce Wayne and Lois Lane uh, where they fall in love with each other. And one of the sacrifices that Bruce has to make when he resurrects Superman is he has to give up Lois. Um, and you can see little influences of that now in retrospect um, in BVS and in this movie. And that's just one of them, the corn specifically the corn um you in the corn well i mean the corn is is good so clark regaining his memories it feels super heartfelt um we we also find out one of my nitpicks from 2017 was that batman seemed to completely forget about the nightmare sequence um he meets barry allen and he never mentions it like he's never like oh i saw you in a dream i had d d a year ago you know like he never never thinks about, he never mentions it, but he does mention it here, which is great. Um, Superman goes and he gets the black suit and now we're, we're, we're getting to the finale of the movie. Um, I will say as much as I liked the finale and I liked the way they defeated Steppenwolf, it felt super underwhelming when it's been, you know, cause the finale is what you spend your whole movie building up to. And when there's four hours of build up and like, 20 minutes of finale yeah it, it, it just kind of, it, it, it didn't hit right yeah it, it, it i don't know it just felt um it just felt kind of underwhelming to me yeah like everything everything is good that scene on its own is 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 stellar i mean um and I'll, I'll talk about the Flash thing in a second, because I do. That's my favorite part of the whole finale. But the fight with the League against Steppenwolf is is really neat. And on its own, it's great. But it's so short in comparison to, which I guess is the same issue BVS had, right? You have the whole movie, and you lead to a two-minute fight scene between Superman and Batman. Um, oh, not and also that, but just kind of... There's the Superman scene where he suits up again in the most frustrating black suit ever. Yeah, um, and it's not explained. It's not given any reason to exist. We don't know why it's there. He keeps it on after, well, after he's been resurrected. Yeah, uh, like Superman, Superman again, which kind of feels weird, I guess. I don't know. But like the first flight scene, which is a fantastic scene, it's got the amazing score in the background. Uh, yeah, where they uh, reuse <laughs> they reuse the flight music. Um, well, no, they reuse Russell Crowe's voiceover from Man of oh, Steel. Oh yes, where he I was going to say they reuse Russell Crowe's voiceover from Unhinged. <laughs> well, no, they reuse his voiceover from Man of Steel, where Clark Kent was a a newborn. <laughs> he doesn't remember this. Like why Russell Crowe wasn't recording that to put it in the fortress. Like it, he was just talking to his son. Like I, I don't know. That's that's frustrating. Well, just the whole scene, like it's a really well done scene. Like that, that first flight scene from Man of Steel still gets me. So, yeah, dude, it's like, amazing. It's amazing, and it just it bugs me because this one's kind of short. Everything mm -hmm. in the movie felt kind of abrupt. Well, they had to get all the content in, and they didn't have much time, Josh. Oh, I mean, you only have four hours. What are you meant to do? Right. Um, Superman's return in. I like better for this movie. Um, and this the universe, one is... but the theatrical one feels more like Superman. And so for yeah. that reason, I've got kind of a nerd thing for it. Yeah. Um, but this would definitely fits in better tonally with the rest of the movie and fits in better with, with, um, with this universe, you know, what, what does he say? I don't think so. Or something like that. Yeah, uh, Not impressed. Not impressed. Yeah. That's it. I, I prefer the truth justice line, but that's, that's a whole other, a whole other discussion. Right, yeah, but well, the the final scene in this is pretty neat for the most part. Like it, yeah. so it's like it's uh, it's really neat with the yeah. flash stuff. The flash stuff is yes. stellar. Well, there's, um, there's, there's twenty minutes of just kind of them messing about in the city, kind of you know superheroing. I guess you call it. Yeah, which is uh, awesome. And I loved I loved seeing that. Yeah, that was fun. Um, it, it didn't go on for long enough, right? That that should have yeah. been. I mean, it's the climax of your movie. That needs to, to to take some time if your movie is four hours long. Yeah, and then, well, yeah, that that happens for not enough time, and then they get to Steppenwolf, and it's like done. He's dead, right? Superman comes into the fight, and it's over instantly because Superman's the most powerful being in existence. Um, but the Flash stuff, I want to talk about that because the 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 end fight, 
the idea behind it is Cyborg is going to merge with the Mother Boxes, and then Flash is going to run at supersonic speeds and shove him into them to give him enough force so that he can separate them, which is awesome. Super cool. Um, and they, they do a, a really neat fake out where uh, the Flash gets shot um, by by the parademons. Yeah, and he's, like, he's like, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, and he's faking it out, and he's trying to keep everybody optimistic and hopeful, even though he knows that he can't do it. Uh, and he's trying to heal himself quickly, and but then then the league loses. And I, for a second, I thought, man, this would be the most Zack Center thing ever to end the movie here. There was part of me that thought that the movie was going to end with them what? losing. What's about it was originally going to, and then when he realized he probably wasn't going to get a sequel unless this does well, he had to reshoot it. I don't think so, because it doesn't feel like the other reshoots that, that come later. Um, it looks phenomenal, I will it say. Looks so good. And yeah, so, so Flash is I, like, think, okay. I think well, it was intended because we had the footage after the fight already for Whedon's movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, so, uh, when, when, when they revive Superman, it's the same scene where, like, you know, he he runs around to build up energy to touch uh, the thing to load it with energy, so it reboots Superman essentially. And it's really neat because he's like, "Oh, when I start approaching the speed of light, time gets a bit weird." And it's like in that scene specifically, uh, he's running around and he dives for it, and it he goes so fast that time just about starts reverting, like it right. it, it yeah. moves just out the it's like tiny it's like oh that's really cool yeah the, then, the, the picture of jonathan kent starts floating out of the water with the yeah, fish yeah. which is clearly symbolism for fish floating out of the water the, the picture of jonathan kent gets me because every time i see it i just think of his death i just think of a bus full of children drowning the way that this picture i just think i've known my superpowered son don't save me right um but yeah so that that's a really neat setup and then they pay off in this where the league loses like there's a big explosion they're all dead yeah uh, and um, I like that they didn't show what happens to them in the explosion, like initially, like they didn't show their flesh tearing from their body. But no, yeah. what Flash does is he starts reversing time, and it's the coolest time travel scene I have ever seen in my life. Uh, the as he's running towards Cyborg and the Mother Boxes, time starts reversing, and the explosion is also reversing, and the ground starts rebuilding itself as he's like going. Superman, like, Superman, like, reconstructs. That's what I was going to get to. Like, we didn't see it happen in real time when the explosion happened, but we get to see the reverse of it. We see all of their bodies and their skeletons as they're reconstructing and their flesh is reforming around it, and it's so so cool and then flash pushes cyborg into the mother boxes and and causes them to separate but doing it in reverse was awesome um it's one of the coolest things that this movie does and i loved i loved that i love everything that the flash does in this um but that's basically the end of the movie we have the epilogue which has another nightmare sequence um but uh, the epilogue doesn't really play into the plot much the the nightmare scene kind of comes out of nowhere and it's fine. I liked it much better than I thought I was going to. Um, the, the, yeah, the Joker Batman stuff was actually kind of neat. I actually found myself yeah. liking it. If, was... if they give Zack Snyder another Justice League movie, I want it to be 100% that. I want to see Justice League Mad Max because he would be great at that. That's something he could absolutely tackle. Deconstructing these characters, showing how, they, how, how characters would adapt to a post-apocalyptic world would be stellar. That's what I want to see. I don't want to see like the normal Justice League handled by him. Um, although I do think he did a, a he did a good job here. It, it's, um, it's a better job than I was expecting it to be. Yeah. Um, but I would much rather see him tackle something like that because that even in that that one little scene that was super cool. Mm, um, yeah, seeing Batman have to like like break his moral code and work with uh, the Joker like that was awesome. Um, I really liked all of that stuff. Um, so that kind of gets us into final thoughts. What what are your what's your big takeaway? What, like, what are your final thoughts for the movie? Uh, Aquaman is useless. Yes, Aquaman is useless. I agree. Uh, but yeah, Aquaman is useless. Uh, the OST is phenomenal. The visual effects, I think, ninety nine percent of the time are fantastic. It's a better movie than I would fantastic. Mr. Lucas is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, it, it was a better movie than I was expecting it to be. However, I also have to say it's a better movie, but 
it was four hours long. And like I know I know I'm harping on about four hours a lot, but making making a movie in four hours that is good isn't that big a stretch. Because in four hours you have a lot of time to flesh out conflicts and characters and story and setting. You basically have time to make a story. Um and to make like to make a good movie, you need to take that and you need to be able to condense that to like two hours, two hours, thirty minutes. Yeah, I I agree. It, um, but yeah, it was good mostly. Yeah, I I re- like I said, really like that second half. Um, really love that second half. Like you were saying, the challenge with making a movie isn't being able to film a bunch of stuff that's going to be good. The challenge is being able to film a bunch of stuff that's going to be good when you have to cut half of it out. Um, and again, and, the first two hours of this movie are just it, it it's just exposition set up. Yes, I mean it is. It, which is it, like usually that's fine because movie like yeah the intro to your movie should be exposition set up, but it's just there's so much of it. Yeah, it. I yeah, that's that's kind of the problem. Um, there's so much of this movie with Man of Steel. It's a movie that I like. I can casually toss on Man of Steel and just watch it. Yeah. You have to dedicate a day to watching this movie. You can't just toss it on and watch it. Um, which is part of the problem. Um, yeah, like I like say, this isn't ultimately this is a good movie, and I think I can say we both enjoyed it a good amount. Um, it's just one of those things where I like this movie, but I don't think I'd want a Snyderverse. Yeah, I I I can kind of I can kind of agree with you there. I I don't think that um, I I don't think I want to see. A sequel to this. Um, I liked it enough to to want to, but I don't think a, a cut down theatrical version of this is going to be as good. And I don't think Zack Snyder would be able to pull that off. Um, and so, I mean, that's just kind of kind of where we're at. You know, it, it it sucks, but that's just kind of the, the 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 way it goes. And so. Yeah. Um, I I liked it. I really, I really enjoyed oh, I, it. Yeah, no, I like again for all the nitpicks that we have about this movie. It is, it's good. Um, it, it's really good. Uh, I'd I'd recommend watching it. Um, it just kind of comes to that stipulation of when you watch it, make sure to skip out in the first two hours. Right. I mean, yeah. That if you've seen Theatrical Justice League. You can skip out on it. You can skip out on it. Now it does uh, some of the, um, some of the best stuff, like character stuff, comes in those first two hours, but you just kind of have to uh, say. You kind of have to go like, like it, it. It's like it's like the James subplot in Twin Peaks season two. I knew you were gonna go with that. <laughs> it's like you want to watch the rest of Twin Peaks, but there's so much James in there. Yes, I know. Ezra Miller is the coolest. <laughs> Ezra Miller has always been the coolest, but uh, sometimes I don't want to watch him perv over a woman who opens the door for him. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, yeah, that it's very conflicting. I would definitely recommend you watch this it, movie. Uh, ultimately, I'd recommend it. It's just kind of like I said, there's a lot of nitpicks to be had in this movie. Uh, Steppenwolf kind of sounds like the mummy from the mummy, it, which it, is weird. Now, I should, it should be noted, if you're not a comic book fan, you're not going to like this movie. No, not at all. Just not. This is a movie made for comic book fans. Yes, absolutely. Like, without question, without a doubt, this movie is made for for comic book fans or Zack Snyder fans. So don't go into this thinking you're going to, you're going to love this movie if you're just like a casual movie fan, because you're not, I promise. Like you said, um, this, this isn't a movie that you can kind of like, oh, I'll stick this on in the background and get some work done. Yeah, you, you do have to dedicate some time to it. Um, you have to dedicate four hours of your life to it. You have to make a day out of watching this movie. Um, but if you have the chance to do that and you have the opportunity and want to, because you're a comic book fan and you're a fan of these characters and a fan of, of, of maybe even Zack Snyder, you're going to like this. So, But if you're a fan of Zack Snyder, you've already seen it. So if you're just a normal casual movie fan, um, if you're Zach Snyder, you've already seen this movie, right? Yeah, if you're just a casual movie fan, 
then you're 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 not gonna like it, and I wouldn't recommend it. But everybody else, those comic book fans and those fans of Zack Snyder, I do think you'll like it. So I would I would recommend you check it out uh, because it is good. I I I really like this movie. Um, so yeah, that's, that's I, mean, I, mean, this movie, I just don't think I'd watch it again. Right? Yeah, probably not. It, I if I ever watch it again, it'll just be the second half. Right, yeah. If I watch it again, it'll be a clip on YouTube. Right, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, that's it. We've done it. We talked about the Snyder Cut. I mean, we didn't even mention the uh, the spiders that totally aren't with of, of the Matrix worms. There's so many things that we missed. We may have to come back and do like a part two in the future or something. Oh, I don't know. Oh, that... I mean, we didn't we didn't talk about uh, how Cyborg would blame his dad for his mom's death, even though she drove into oncoming traffic. Gosh, we're running out of time. In five yeah. years, we'll come back and do a retrospective. When when Justice League Part 4 is coming out, we'll do a retrospective of the series. Right, exactly. All right, thanks everybody for listening, no matter where you listened. Um, it's been fun. Me and Josh talked about Center Cut. We will see you on the next episode of Simi Pro. Peace out.